I saved $1,300 making these round tables this way. But when it was all said and done, was it worth it? In today's build video, we'll answer that question and I'll show you exactly how I made these circular style tables. So let's get started. So the story behind today's build all started when my stepdad reached out to me one day at the beginning of the summer. He had just moved to a new house in North Carolina and he wanted me to make him two custom round tables. One was a dining room table and the other was a high top table or a high boy table. I don't really know what it's called. We looked it up online and there was a ton of different answers, but there's no real definitive answer of what you call this style table. Basically, the tall tables that you see at a bar is what he wanted. I have a ton of old walnut that I had gotten for free, so I figured that that would work perfectly because one, I love walnut, and two, I don't have to buy any materials, which saves everyone time and money. And who doesn't love saving time and money? Am I right? So win-win all around. However, there is a downside to using old free wood. There's gonna be a lot of knots and a lot of rotten spots. In order to combat that issue, my plan is to put patches in all those specific areas where it's real nasty and rotten. Before I did that though, I needed to glue up these main walnut blanks for the tabletops. My go-to method for that is to use biscuits. The biscuits are gonna help keep everything aligned when we're gluing it together. I went ahead and traced a rough outline to the dimensions of the circle that I wanted it to be. This will make sure that there are no exposed biscuits on any of the edges of these two tables. Along with that, I made some lines where I wanted all the biscuits to be placed. I also numbered the pieces as well, which is going to be super helpful that if a tornado were to randomly rip through my shop and scatter my pieces of walnut all over the place, I'll know which one goes where. I know that's a terrible example, but you get what I'm saying. Anyways, moving on to cutting out these biscuits. There's going to be many different ways that you can go about gluing these boards together, but I think I found the easiest way for me is to use biscuits. Biscuits are going to help keep everything nice and aligned when you actually go to glue these boards together. And if you've seen any of the other build videos I have on my channel, then you know how I feel about anything being crooked or not aligned right. I am not a fan. I will not have it. Period. And it's probably one of the only things that I'm super OCD about. That and being late. I don't know. It just throws my brain for a loop. The glue up for these tabletops was a little unique, as you're about to witness. I wanted everything to be as uniform as possible with these tabletops. So in order to make that happen, I have one center board and then I place three boards on each side of that center board. These three boards are identical to one another, acting as a mirror to the other side because they have the exact same dimensions. There is one minor annoyance, however, to gluing it up like that, and that comes when you're actually spreading the glue. As you can see, the two boards on the outside of the tables were much wider than the rest of the boards. So when spreading the glue, I had to be extra careful when reaching over that wide board to spread the glue onto the smaller boards. I'm not really afraid of getting any glue on me, but if you knock this tall board over, you're going to cause a heck of a domino effect. Although, I am sure that my boys would get a good laugh seeing that because their favorite part of these videos is when their old man messes up. Or when they can make a small cameo, of course. The glue up was successful though because neither of those situations occurred which is always a plus because time is money. This is a little hint of what the theme of today's video is. So much so that the original design of this table was going to be a round epoxy tabletop, which I might add would have taken up more time, money, and resources. After a little bit of back and forth, we ultimately decided to throw that idea out completely, but instead we were gonna make some really cool metal bases for each of these tables to sit on. The legs at first were going to be super basic. It was really just going to be one big metal pipe with one big heavy metal plate on the bottom. But after we simplified the tabletop design itself, we decided to upgrade the fanciness of the pedestal bases. One of my favorite aspects of this build really isn't about the build itself, but it was the fact that my stepdad didn't want to know what it was going to look like in the end. All that he knew was that it was going to be a walnut wood top and a metal pedestal base. So the design itself, he left completely up to me, which allowed me to do something that I had never done before, which is something that I love to do because there is nothing worse than being a creative and just turning out the same thing over and over and over again. Unless you love making that thing or it makes you good money, then I totally understand that. I guess I just love stepping outside of my comfort zone and trying something new. Because even if I did screw it up, I've learned something that I can keep in my mind and hopefully not do it on the next project. I did have to keep in mind that these tables, although not being in the same room as the other, you would be able to see them together at the same time. So I needed them to have the same kind of shape and overall look as the other. That's more of an aesthetic choice though on my end because I do enjoy when I see items in homes that pair nicely together. Also, it kind of goes with my OCD where I want things to be organized and together as well. I realize that project style videos seem to be on the decline these days, and I think I know why. 
With the state of the world and the massive amounts of content that are out there, I find myself swimming through an endless sea of entertainment that my attention is constantly being pulled in so many different directions. I guess what I'm trying to say is, thank you for watching. Even if you're on the toilet right now, I'm happy to help with passing the time by. So, if you have a hand available, just give this video a courtesy like. I'd appreciate that. After letting the tabletops dry for a day, I began prepping them for what would be the most time-consuming and overall hardest part of this build, and that was making the table appear thicker than it actually was. You see, I wanted to challenge myself not only in making the biggest round table that I had ever made, but I also wanted to add a bevel to the edge of this table. Pro tip, I recommend using a paint scraper to help remove as much of the excess glue before you start sanding. Excess glue isn't good for your saw blades, your planer, and it just takes a lot of extra time to sand it off. It's an extra step, but it makes sanding easier, and if you're not a fan of sanding like me, then you'll thank yourself later. If you've ever cut out a circle before, then you know you need a pretty big circle jig to make that happen. But just in case that you don't have a circle cutting jig to make the size circle that you need for your projects, then you definitely want to check out the video where I show you how you can make three different circle cutting jigs with three different tools. I'll link that video in the description down below. I personally like using a router circle cutting jig for circles that are larger than three feet. I could have used the bandsaw circle cutting jig for the smaller tabletop because it was smaller than three feet, but since I already had the router circle cutting jig set up, I just use that for both tabletops. I don't think this is probably the right bit to use for this. I think it needs to just be a straight bit. So I did have some issues with the bit I was using when cutting out the circle for the dining room table. The bit just kept pulling down and out of the collet. And I think it was because the pivot screw was just a little bit too small. With that pivot screw being too small and everything moving ever so slightly, it just kept biting a little bit harder than it needed to, which was causing the bit to pull itself out of the collet until it fell out completely. I have used this jig since then, and I changed that pivot screw, and that problem is no longer a thing. With both circles for the tables cut out, I shifted my focus to filling in the spots that were missing towards the edge of the circle with pieces of walnut that I had from the scraps. I'm just making a quarter inch by quarter inch sliver that's going to fill in this missing spot on the table. Taking a piece of the scrap wood that's from the build that you are working on and adding it back to the same piece just feels like welding to me, but with wood. This is a small hole, but it is too big for wood filler. So the better option here is to fill it in with an actual piece of wood. And that's what we're doing in this instance. While that little piece is drying, I began prepping the other pieces of walnut that were going to be used to make both tables appear thicker than they actually are. I made my clean edges on the table saw, and then I set an angle that I was going to cut each piece to. Essentially, they were just acting as a frame around the circle, which is going to make it appear thicker on the sides. This is how I'm planning on making the bevels on these tables. I wanted to add the bevels because I wanted this table to appear more thick. So instead of using 8 quarter inch stock and making this table cost way more money, I opted to use a couple thinner layers of stock stacked on top of each other on the outer ring of the circle, making it look like it's super thick. This is where I saved that $1,300 I mentioned in the beginning. With this approach, I'm using less material than I otherwise would have needed, so I saved a nice chunk of change. Do I recommend that everyone do this? Probably not. It's that age-old question, though. What's more important, your time or your money? I was in the camp that I didn't really have either right now, but that's a story for another time. But ask yourself this, though. If you have no time, but you have the money, maybe your time is more valuable. However, if the opposite is true for you, so you have no money, but a lot of time, then maybe you opt to go the other route. In my case, I already had the material bought and paid for, so it was a matter of do I spend more money for thicker stock, or do I get resourceful? So I chose to spend a little bit of extra time and get resourceful, and use the thinner stock I had to give the tables a thicker look to get the outcome that I was hoping to achieve. There definitely was more work this way, but again, it saved me $1,300. All I knew is that I wanted a thick table, because thick in my eyes looks more high-end and solid, versus a thin table that looks more fragile and probably won't last a lifetime, which is really what I aim for with all of my pieces. The idea that someone buys your product and then keeps it in the family for hopefully generations to follow is a cool way of playing a part in someone else's legacy, and that in and of itself is super rewarding. And really, unless you stick your hand underneath this table, you'd have no idea that it was a couple layers of wood instead of just one. I did end up using a nail gun on the first layer for just a little bit of added strength, and I knew that I was going to cover it up with one more layer on top of it so you'd never see the nails anyway. Using the nails allowed me to do a little bit more in that one day because the extra strength from them is going to act as the clamp while the glue is drying. On the big dining room table, I added two layers of walnut around the sides of the circle, 
and only one layer on the high top tabletop. I was really excited with how both tabletops were coming together, and with this being the biggest round table that I'd ever made, with it being walnut on top of all of that, I was really just kind of waiting for something to go wrong. So I didn't want to jinx myself by saying it too soon. Before we dive into the messy part of this build, I needed to first make a jig for my router so I could make the bevel on the bottom of this table. It's really just a circle cutting jig, but it has a ramp on the edge, so when you go around the circle, you're gonna be moving the router vertically up and down, and that's gonna be shaping the table. My cameraman and buddy Nick said the shape reminded him of a classic UFO, and I can definitely see that. He thinks that aliens are actually just demons making an appearance every once in a while. So anyways, we'll save the conspiracy theories on aliens for another time. Maybe. So after giving the new router jig a quick test, it was time to remove some excess material from the first layer of the dining room table. After that, I flipped the table over on the back side so I could have easier access to the layers to make the bevel detail around the edge of this table. A lot of the same rules apply when you're using a circle cutting jig. I needed to attach a temporary piece of walnut to the center of this table, so I had something I could attach my circle cutting jig to as I pivoted around the table. Once that part was in place, I needed to adjust the bit to the height that I wanted. I didn't want to take off too much because if I screwed up and took off too much, that was going to mean more work. So I started off slow and I took off less than I needed to the first pass. Once I had the height and the depth set to a spot that I was comfortable with, I began making my way around the table and taking off a little bit each pass until I made it all the way around. It was a lot of just going up and down and up and down. It was a really long process. It probably took me over an hour to do this and it was super messy. Once I completed the outside, I began routing out the bottom of the inside of this circle, making all the edges circular and smooth. Even though it's the bottom of this circle and no one's ever gonna see it, I still wanted it to look good. And nothing makes a project look better than sanding. Ah yes, sanding. I really do wish I enjoyed sanding more because it's what makes or breaks a project. So let's move on to something that I do enjoy. If you recall from earlier, I mentioned that this wood was super old, so it has some rotten and soft spots that I wanted to replace with some patches that I made on my CNC. Rather than just using walnut, I went with another one of my favorite kinds of wood, sapelli. I really chose this sapelli because of the reddish color, it complements the walnut color, giving it a contrasty look for the whole piece. I knew once I put a finish on the top that it would make the sapelli pop out even more. The pill shape came for me just looking at the rotten spots on the wood, and they were really just long and skinny. So I didn't really want to make a big circle or a shape that was too obnoxious. And as a bonus, the patches go the same direction as the grain in the wood. When the sun hits it, it'll have this tiger eye effect, which you'll get to see what I'm talking about later on. It's just a fun little detail. Again, I wanted these tables to feel like a set piece, so whatever I did to one, I had to do to the other. This one's a little big, so we gotta yeah, shrink it a little, so we're gonna like bend it back some. So the legs for these tables required me to bend and cut all these pieces to the same length. Bending metal, for anyone who's done it, knows that metal is not very forgiving. Once it's in a specific shape, it really doesn't want to be formed into anything else. So I bent the pieces as best as I could, and really hoped that they wouldn't give me any problems when it came time to weld them together. So after all the pieces of metal that I'm making the table legs out of were cut to size, I needed to make a stem. It's really just a temporary structure that I'll be placing in the middle of the table to balance and hold the metal as I adjust the pieces into the form that I need to weld. All the pieces are going to need to stay in this shape, and these stems are going to allow me to do that for both of the tabletops. To do all the welding for these table legs, I asked my buddy Andy if I could use his awesome shop to bring these designs to life. He's got all the tools that we needed and any that you could imagine. He's got a great setup because he's been welding and painting for a living for the past 25 years, so it's safe to say that he knows his way around metalwork. Not to mention, his shop is so cool. Tons of character and cool things spread out all over the shop. I guess when you have the space, it's kind of like, why not, right? The welding of these legs was really a two-person ordeal. I could have done this by myself, but it would have taken so much longer, and it probably would have been way more stressful. No, it definitely would have been more stressful, so I'm super grateful Andy was up to help on these legs. The first steps to welding these metal legs together was to make a top and a bottom metal ring. These rings are going to do two things. One, it's going to hold the shape and form of the base itself, and two, it's going to act as a support for the table so it doesn't topple over. The metal ring is just a one inch strap that's bent into a circle. So the beauty of a metal welding table is that you can just tack the ring to the table, making it one with the table in a sense, which is nice because it makes it much sturdier and more grounded. So when it comes time to welding everything together, I don't have to stress as much about the structure moving because, as you know, the smallest adjustment can throw off your measurements and could cause problems for the build later. Also, Andy had a ton of different zip ties on hand, which can be handy to help keep everything locked down and in the desired shape that you want. 
Another thing that I did to help space out the legs to the positions that I intended them to be in when I was in the designing phase of all this was these little three inch blocks I cut up to act as spacers. Unfortunately, I clearly was off and they were not the right size. I must have just read a number wrong or something. It happens. But this is just another reason why you dry fit projects before making anything permanent. On top of the spacers not being the correct size, it turns out that the center circle of the stem I made was just a little bit too big and it wasn't allowing the metal pieces to touch together as they needed to be. Andy had a little sander that I used to shave off an eighth of an inch or so. He's got everything in this shop, I swear. I need a shop like this, someday. Something I preach to everyone is to hang on to your scrap wood because you never know when it might come in handy. Andy also follows this belief because not to my surprise, he had a container full of scrap wood in it. All these little pieces of cut off two by fours worked out perfectly because they were exactly the size I needed for the spacers. Funny how things work out in your favor like that. We did have to do some minor adjustments to make sure that the temporary stem in the middle was right in the center, which is where I needed it to be. If the legs are off just the slightest bit, then the table is going to act more like a slide for people's drinks and food, which is not really the desired effect we're going for. I wanted it to be perfectly parallel before we put the feet on, which will definitely ensure that these tables are as straight as possible. We did a test to see how flat the top was by putting a sheet of plywood across the top. This is going to show us how uniform each piece was before we started welding. There was one leg that was off a little bit, so we had to adjust that one. Words I live by are measure twice and cut once, or in this case, measure a bunch and only weld once. I need to come up with some words to live by for welding. Maybe just don't burn yourself, because that tends to happen a lot. With everything in place, we began making our way around the table and weld the legs into place, one at a time. I was doing the measuring to make sure everything was where it needed to be while Andy did the welding. I have to say, it was super nice to have an extra hand when doing this, because it would have been way harder. So Andy, if you're watching this, thank you again, and I owe you a case of old style. With the bottom being welded together, we made our way to the inside of the legs. The best way to weld the middle was to attack it from the top, because not only did we not have to move anything because it was still tacked to the welding table, but it also hid the welds really nicely. I like to hide my welds so that the piece looks like it was just bent and shaped from one piece of metal. Obviously, that's rarely the case, because no one is Superman. I mean, except Superman. Welding the middle gave me more peace of mind that the metal legs would have no way of shifting over time. If you do the same thing on the bottom half, or like right under yeah, that weld, yeah. just make it a little stronger. Yeah, That'll be good. Now that the legs are not going anywhere, we went ahead and cut the tacks that were connecting the base ring to the metal table. This allowed us to flip the leg over to make another circle for the top ring. The stem that I made to hold the structure together took longer than I care to share to remove, but it eventually popped out. Now that the leg was flipped over, I went ahead and checked for level, and I must say it was indeed level, and that made me very happy to see. Really, we're gonna do the same process on the top ring that we did for the bottom ring. It was pretty easy to just weld that ring, making it all one. After that, we repeated the same process for the high top legs. Really, the only difference was they were less pieces of bent metal and the pieces were just longer. It was even faster to make the high top legs after we made the dining room leg. We had a little practice, if you will. However, with that being said, there was something that we planned to do with the high top leg that required a little extra step that you'll see in a minute. First though, we needed to cap off the ends to all the metal pieces for the feet that we were gonna use for putting on these legs. I'm just cutting a little relief cut and then adding a piece of strap metal to weld in place, capping the legs off. I'll flip the legs over and do the same thing on the other side. The inspiration that made me wanna make these metal legs this way really came from the fact that I knew the tops of these tables were gonna be a simple and clean design, which really gave me the opportunity to make the legs for these tables the part that really stood out. I did look around on the internet for ideas, so that was part of how I got the idea for the legs overall design. I've never bent as much metal as I did for this project before, so it gave me a chance to experiment and sharpen my skill set even further with metal work. I really enjoy combining wood and metal into my projects. I just love the look that you get when you bring these two different kinds of materials together. And it's kind of becoming a part of my brand as well. So that's pretty cool. Future clients will see my portfolio and hopefully hire me because they've seen what I've previously built and will want me to make something similar for them. My buddy who owns his own video company always tells me, only show the work you enjoy making because you'll attract more people who also like that work. So something you need to keep in mind if you're looking to sell more of your services Show what you want to sell. Something that I knew I definitely wanted to include on these table legs were adjustable feet. I'm sure you've experienced this on multiple occasions because I know I have when I was younger and going out to various bars. Without a shadow of a doubt, I would always seem to get the wobbly table. 
Of course, the first thing that comes to mind is to check to see if there's any adjustable feet on the legs so I can make the table level. Nine out of 10 times, there isn't. So I usually just grab a couple drink coasters. You know, the flimsy little round cardboard ones that they have sitting around in most bars. I'll MacGyver a janky way to keep that table from wobbling and annoying me all night. If this has happened to you, then hit the like button because you understand the frustration. So what we did to add the feet was a little different for both table bases. For the dining room table, we made the feet by welding a quarter 20 nut to a washer. The idea was that once the washer was all welded off, we would weld the washer to the pedestal base so that we had a thread for our feet to go to, allowing it to be adjustable. Andy cleaned these up over on his grinder and then it was time to figure out exactly where they were gonna go. Once we figured that out, we marked each spot with the Sharpie and began drilling each hole. I wanted it to be as hidden as possible, but not to the effect that it was gonna make it hard to make any adjustments. With it being a one inch tube, a step bit was not going to get the size that we needed. So we had to actually step up each drill bit one at a time. Jumping over to the pedestal base for the high top table, we added a few tabs to the top of the base. This was what was gonna be holding the legs and the tabletop together, making them one whole piece. We did this for the dining room table as well. While I was doing that, Andy was cleaning up the threads on the feet and making sure that the table was level and perpendicular with the floor. To do that, he just used a bar that crosses from one side to the other side of the legs and pretty much just wanted to make sure that the nut sits flush with the bar to ensure that it's perpendicular with the floor. You'll notice that we have a bolt inside of the washer. And the reason for that is that when we're welding, we don't want to get any slag or any extra stuff inside of the threads, which would make it so that it didn't in fact thread on a foot making it not functional. And I was totally cool with Andy tackling that because again, he's got a lot more experience when it comes to welding small details that others may miss because of lack of experience. Kind of like me. The feet for the pedestal base for the high top table, we took a little bit of a different approach as far as how we made it adjustable. How we did it was attach a threaded coupling rather than a nut and a washer, which is what we did on the feet for the dining room table. The reason we went with this approach over the other is that we didn't have any space for the bolt to go inside the metal tube of the leg, so we had no choice but to put the bolt on the outside. Adding a little angle to it meant I needed to cut a small piece of it. I've put adjustable feet on wooden table legs before, but this is the first time that I've ever put feet on a metal set of legs. With the help of a big red magnet to hold the thread coupling in place, I went ahead and attached them to the table legs of the high top base. Of course, once they were attached, I had to test out the feet I bought to make sure that they threaded through, and thankfully they did. If you recall from earlier, I capped off the bottom of the pedestal base for the high top legs. The solution that we came up with was to pour sand into each of the tubes. Originally, we considered alternative options, such as putting a big metal plate on the bottom of the legs, welding it to the ring of the base. But we decided to nix that idea because we thought if something falls into the base, it wasn't gonna be easy to get it out. We also considered using little BBs. You know, little copper BBs? Pew pew! I can't say the word G-U-N. YouTube might flag me if I do. My neighbor Josh actually has one of those little pew pews. But that's kind of where I got the idea from that would have been a little bit more expensive. I also did a little math and the amount that we would have had to have used for each was pretty close in weight. Didn't make much sense to spend a lot more when they were effectively doing the same thing. So ultimately we saved a bunch just by using a bag of sand that only cost me $5. So you can't beat that. We used a long black zip tie to measure and determine how much sand we were putting into each tube. Once the tubes were filled, we topped it off with some wood glue. Thinking back, I probably should have used something other than wood glue, but it was what I had on hand. It just took a little bit longer to dry. When it came time to putting the finish on the tabletops, I wanted to use something that I've used on previous builds and that I know would look good with the walnut. It's also gonna help the sapelli patches really pop, especially when the light hits them, I found. The finish we decided to use was lacquer. It goes on really nice and easy, and it also dries relatively quickly, I found. So I was able to get a couple coats on it in a day. After I slapped a few coats of lacquer, I moved on to adding the threaded inserts that were actually gonna hold the pedestal bases to the tops themselves. This was a pretty easy process. I just placed the tabletops on a separate table with a blanket under it so it wouldn't get all scratched up. I marked the spots where I wanted to drill out the holes where the threaded inserts were gonna go. In order to keep the bases aligned and in the proper position, I used a super bright green highlighter and made a few marks in a couple spots so I could align those marks up. Looking back on this build, I absolutely love how it turned out. The legs came out awesome, especially after Andy painted them. They just pop with that flat black finish. If there was one thing that I took away from this experience, it was that I might approach how I made the bevel for each table differently next time. I was able to save, like I said, $1,300 by layering smaller pieces of walnut on top of each other and then carving the wood into the shape that I desired, but it did take more time and it was a lot messier. You know what doesn't take a lot of time and isn't messy? Making your own circle cutting jig. 
Check out the video linked on screen where I show you how to make three different kinds of circle cutting jigs. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.